Hi and welcome to the first Quadcast from Quad Learning Studios. Uh, I'm here today with Esther Miller from Tufts University uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, who is a microbial ecologist. So, welcome to the show. Thank you, <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, could you tell us all a little bit about what you are studying? Yeah, so I look at um, sauerkraut and kimchi, so for fermented vegetables, and I'm looking at where the bacteria that ferment these products actually come from. So we've eaten them for hundreds of years, but no one's actually asked where are these bacteria coming from. So the, the flavor of sauerkraut kimchi is caused by uh, the products made by these bacteria? Yep, they're fermented foods. They're fermented by a group of bacteria called lactic acid bacteria. And this is like a big group of many different species that all ferment plant sugars and turn it into lactic acid. And that's why they're a little bit sharp, a little bit tangy um, and delicious. Uh, could you explain how your research is different to how microbial ecology has been done previously? Yeah, so traditionally we think of microbial ecologists as people that might look at one bacteria, or microbiologists I should say, look at one bacteria in a petri dish and see how is that interacting when I add one other bacteria. But in the Wolf Lab where I'm doing my research, we look at fermented foods because they have a collection of many different species. And you can say, um, in a natural-ish environment, how do bacteria, maybe yeasts and fungi, all interact with one another? And you find that's very different results to what you'd find if you just uh, had a look at each of these bacteria separately. It's, it's a much more realistic... Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're, with next generation sequencing, you can look at um, all of the bacteria in the human gut and ask questions about thousands of species. Um, and when you try and pull apart what individuals are doing, it's really complicated. But when you look at fermented foods, there might be about 20 species. And you can start to see that it's not one bacteria affecting one other bacteria, but they can have like big groups of effects and uh, multiple different levels that we haven't thought of before. So your research is still ongoing, but what have you found so far? Okay, so the first thing that I found um, in the first project that I looked at was lactic acid bacteria, these bacteria that actually ferment the cabbages, are really, really rare. So we That's think, surprising. Yeah, really shocking. Um, let me tell you how you make sauerkraut first yeah, of all, and then that'll it. make it a little clearer. So to make kimchi, you take a cabbage, you slice it up, that releases plant sugars. Because if you think of a cabbage, the leaves can be a little tough and leathery. So you want to chop it up and then add salt. So not tons of salt, about 2% weight of salt. So you just weigh it, add salt. And then as you massage it into the cabbage, you draw out cabbage juice. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the bacteria that are present on that cabbage are the ones that go on to ferment it. So you pack it into mason jars or a crock or whatever. And the bacteria, the natural microbiome of that cabbage is what ferments it. So the bacteria aren't added, they're already present nope, in the cabbage? On the cabbage. Mm. Um, and we know that on the cabbage because you can make it with gloves on, you can sterilize the environment, mm. you can, so long as you've got that cabbage, you should in theory get um, a sauerkraut produced. So the traditional way of making sauerkraut, the only ingredients are cabbage, salt, water. Yeah. Yeah, nothing yep. else is added. So. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. So the, the different bacteria are already present on the cabbage mm -hmm. and they react with the uh, I guess internal juices of yeah. the cabbage and create that sort of vinegary flavor that you get with fermented uh, vegetables. Um, and have you found that sauerkraut and kimchi are basically the same or they're the same from different places? Yeah, we've looked at... Kim so kimchi is a little different in that you add peppers mm -hmm. and then that can alter... Um, who's there a little bit, but generally speaking, uh, the bacteria go in a succession. So uh, I'll come back to your, your second question, like <laughs> are they different at different places? So you've got bacteria on the cabbage, it's got that cabbage juice that you've just drawn out, and the bacteria immediately start digesting that. And one thing I forgot to mention is when you've compacted it into that mason jar or jam jar or whatever container you're making it in, you have to really compact it in. And that creates an anaerobic environment. So there's no oxygen present. And then that gives bacteria that don't need oxygen a real advantage. They can take off and start producing uh, waste products. And one of those waste products is lactic acid. And then that lactic acid lowers the pH of the environment, enabling 
other bacteria to grow. So you get a succession if you think of um, classic ecology where you have like primary species coming in. And like when a new wave. island is formed. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing in a new jar of sauerkraut. Mm. We've got like the first colonizers and then they move on to second colonizers. So anaerobic, uh, there are some bacteria that can uh, survive without oxygen. Yep. Uh, are they very common now? Um, so these are the lactic acid bacteria. Mm. That, so there are other species that can survive without oxygen, but the lactic acid bacteria that really thrive in the anaerobic conditions um, they're the ones that we found are really actually very rare. So that's why it's unusual that every time you make a sauerkraut, it in theory works. And we think that's because you only need a tiny amount. Um, and also when you think of commercial sauerkraut producers, they don't actually add lactic acid bacteria either. Um, they're using masses of cabbage. So if you're adding like a ton of cabbage to produce your sauerkraut, there's gonna be some of that bacteria and how then it will how few off. do you need for it to work? Would it work with one bacteria? Um, bacteria? We've done experiments in the lab, and I think it can be as low as just a few cells yeah. per, um, per ferment. Well, like we've done it on a much smaller scale, but yeah, you can have a really low mm -hmm. amount, um, and it will still take off because they just have that advantage of being able to metabolize the plant sugars in anaerobic conditions very well and they're salt tolerant, I forgot to stress that. So the lactic acid bacteria, they thrive when there's no oxygen, they produce this lactic acid, they lower the pH, yep. and that changes the environment. Yeah, yeah, they modify their environment, they prevent pathogens um, from growing. So on the plant, you've got to think that there's a lot of Pseudomonas and other bacteria, but they're all, if you think of a plant leaf, it's very aerobic it's out there and when you've made a sauerkraut it's very different from being a leaf floating in the breeze to yeah. like compacted in a jar and very salty so that environmental change that humans have done mm -hmm. is a first level of like selecting who is present in that population and then the second is the bacteria themselves start to change the environment and select further who's there. Well, yeah, and when an environment changes, of course, different species can survive in there. So yeah. once the pH drops, you were saying there's a, a different kind of bacteria thrives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the very first bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, so they're all lactic acid bacteria right. that I'm talking about, but there are two distinct groups. There are heterofermenters and homofermenters. So the heterofermenters are the first in the succession. And as they ferment the plant sugars, they make the lactic acid that we talked about, but they can also make uh, acetic acid, which is vinegar, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. So if that persisted, you'd have a very sharp sauerkraut. Yeah. So thankfully, they trail off and we get the homofermenters that just make lactic acid. But one other thing that these heterofermenters do is they produce carbon dioxide. And as that bubbles, and you might have noticed uh, ferments bubbling, as you if you've ever made a ferment, it will so start to give out. Beer at home. <laughs> yeah, it'll start <laughs> to give out little bubbles, and these are, that's bubbles of carbon dioxide, and that pushes out oxygen. So if there was any small residual amount of oxygen left, that will be gone. Oh, excellent. Um, and have you found anything surprising in your results? Yeah. So in my first set of like the first experiment was looking at. Uh, finding that they were really rare and I was surprised by that but then um, what I've been doing more recently is I looked at 17 different brands of fermented <laughs> vegetable product from the New England environment and I did metagenomic sequencing which is where you take the DNA from the sample so you take a sample you extract all of the DNA and you send it off for Illumina sequencing which uh, sequences small fragments of all of the every piece of DNA and then you can start to sort of put it together and look at who is there and it'll give you everything who is there mm -hmm. so a lot of it is cabbage some yeah. <laughs> of it was oyster because the kimchi products are made with fish, so oh, fish of course. sauce yeah, yeah. Um, so I got a lot of interesting reads but I started to see yeast present and I did a really cool thing with this project. Um, I worked with undergrads at Tufts University mm -hmm. um, as part of their undergraduate microbiology course. We plated it out onto Petri dishes, so put a known amount onto agar plates, and they found yeast. Um, and 
There is no literature on yeast as being something that grows in sauerkraut, so that's really exciting. That was very unexpected. Um, you don't know at this point whether yeast contributes to the production of sauerkraut or kimchi? No, I've seen sort of blog posts. I've, when I say I've heard nothing, I've mm -hmm. not seen any scientific paper except like one in the 80s. Like you read something on the internet. Yeah, so, so I read true. something in a blog about yeast um, giving it musty flavors, but mm. I couldn't find any scientific backing to that. So it's something that could be really interesting to explore. And that's something that you've caught by the way that you do your research particularly, right? Um, because previously, uh, people would have looked at these species in isolation yeah. and wouldn't have caught it this way. So how do you actually carry out your experiments, your, your investigations? Yeah. So the first thing that the Wolf Lab likes to do is plate onto two different media types. So when you're using agar plates, you put in media that things like to grow in. So you might use um, brain heart infusion, and that's a lot of meaty <laughs> proteins that certain bacteria really like to grow on. Lactic acid bacteria like growing on a particular media, so we plate it on that. And we add antifungal. So you add a chemical that will prevent yeast from growing. And then we grow it on a yeast plate that would encourage the growth of yeast. And the wolf lab often looks for like, is there the presence of yeast? Is there the presence of bacteria? Mm -hmm. Just because it's good to know like what the whole community is doing, not just focusing in on bacteria. Yeah, I suppose you could think of uh, an equivalent for, I guess, more in everyday life. Not a lot of people have worked with bacteria. It would be like taking uh, one plant or one animal from the jungle and just looking at how it behaves in a cage or in a pot in your house and it's you don't get a real picture if you're no. looking at the bacteria individually maybe it does interact with the yeast or the other species of bacteria that are there and yeah. that tells you something new that we didn't know before yeah and maybe so one thing that I, do, I don't work on this but one thing that we really know is that um, in kombucha for example um, it's a symbiotic community of yeast and bacteria so kombucha is a fermented tea beverage so it's disgusting <laughs> Wow. Okay, yeah. I make it and I like it, but then after you drink it, every day after I drink it, I have a sore throat because <laughs> I think I ferment it too long. It's really, <laughs> it's really hard to get. They say it's good for you, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, again, that's one of those things where you find a lot of things on the internet, but not so many scientific papers, which doesn't mean that it isn't good for you. Yeah. It just, just means maybe that the done. research hasn't yeah. been done. So. Um, you'll know then that um, kombucha has a scoby, so a slimy filamentous cellulose blob that floats on the top. <laughs> and you put sugar in the tea, and then the yeast break down the sugar into ethanol, and then acetic acid bacteria break down that um, ethanol into acetic acid. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. very similar to making beer, but without the second step, so. I, yeah. yeah, but actually you can get beers. Oh, I'll tell you a fun project oh, I go did. For it. So you can get beers that are sour and they have lactic acid bacteria. So a lot of fermented foods, when they're sour, it's either acetic acid bacteria. And I do actually think they have a different name now um, and I'm not even gonna attempt. It's something like, I won't attempt it. It's a very long complicated name um, that was recently changed. But, um, or lactic acid bacteria. And so there's a local brewery in the States that um, is run by X, or they were PhD students at MIT and they've graduated and they set up a brewery yeah. and they isolate yeasts from the environment and they're a really cool brewery that's always yeah, open yeah. to like crazy experiments. I'm always like, hey, Ron, can I do a project? <laughs> um, so I asked them if I could make sauerkraut beer and I oh, wow. isolated individual lactic acid bacteria from sauerkraut mm -hmm. because they smell delicious, they look delicious, I love these bacteria um, and he, brewed beer and then we added one of the different strains to each of a liter of different batches of great quality beer like this is good beer this is like a great beer company yeah, yeah. and then we did a taste testing <laughs> and we got we got flavor notes of bile oh. urine sort of cat flavor hipsters um, will buy it no <laughs> it actually got junked but what yeah. is really interesting and makes me think like this research is really valid is if you in a, if you just add the let the bacteria that are naturally present on the um, barley or whatever grain they're using if you let them just naturally grow um, then you get a great sour beer that everybody loves it's when you take individual isolates and add it back 
that it gave you those really horrible notes. Yeah. So maybe there's something about being part of a community that we're missing. Yeah, that, that really does show that they act differently in isolation than they would as, as a yeah. group, for sure. That's a great segue actually, saying these guys from MIT went and made uh, beer after they graduated. Yeah. Uh, what could we do with your research? What's, what's yeah. next? So there's a few companies in Boston that are now looking at, can you improve um, crop protection or plant growth by altering the microbiome? So we know a little bit about interactions in the rhizosphere. So when you have a plant, anything below the ground in the roots, um, that close interaction between the soil and the root is the rhizosphere. And we know... Oh, like the root nodules with rhizomes yeah. for like the nitrogen cycle. And, exactly, yeah. right? So maybe there's something like that in the phylosphere. So maybe the you could... The phytosphere being... Ah, the phytosphere being the above ground part of the plant. The leaves so and stems. Leaves, stems, and mm. there's unique uh, microbiology in the flower as well. If you look at that, there's a lot of yeast. They don't cross over very day. often. So they don't cross over, but what you tend to get is bulk soil has one, one um, uh, community, mm -hmm. and then that is refined into the rhizosphere and then further refined into right. the phylosphere. Right. But the flower community is altered because pollinators can add course, yeast yeah. and stuff to the nectar. And then it's a very sweet, sticky substance that's sort of like got its own little microbiology yeah. going on. But maybe um, things like rusts that affect plants, they could be prevented. I'm sorry, rusts are a fungus that affects leaves of plants. Oh. And you might see it as like a smutty color on a leaf. Right. Um, yeah. So you, maybe you could add like a phylosphere spray that could help prevent that. Ah, right. okay, so you could look at ways of controlling the microbiology community in various places for various gains. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and one thing that's really interesting is in Florida, there's a Pseudomonas species, which is a gram-negative bacteria that lives on the leaf of orange trees and alters its ability to withstand frost. Oh. So there's a lot of interesting things that we're not, you know, we're not really sure of, or I mean, I think they're pretty sure on that one, but there's a lot of potential for looking at microbiology and plant, plants and protection, but also food microbiology. Um, so we know a lot, or people want to know more about how these lactic acid bacteria interact with the human gut, but we don't know about their um, presence in the environment mm. or their actual effect always on food. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of, of research in the last 10 years, a lot of discoveries in the last 10 years or so that the bacteria and the bacterial community and the microbiology community is a lot more important than we thought it was. It used to be yeah. we just try to get rid of all microorganisms, yeah. get rid of bacteria, sterilize everything, but it turns out that it's actually, yeah. you know, very important. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And you should study an organism as a whole, and that brings you on to the holobiont theory, which is very controversial. <laughs> Google that if you want to know more. <laughs> I don't know how to spell it. Holo, yeah. H-O-L-O, biont. biont. And that's basically saying, um, it. It's basically saying you can't study a human without looking at the microbiology. Mm -hmm. And the humans, you maybe think like, well, you could, you could study that. But um, a good example of where you couldn't study something in isolation would be like a cow. Because you can't have a cow without its cow microbiome because obviously the microbiome is digesting the grass. Mm -hmm. Cows can't digest grass. Uh, so could you use this to make better tasting sauerkraut? <laughs> yeah, in theory, um, well, you could use it to make consistent sauerkraut. Ah. So, as I said, it's very, lactic acid bacteria can be really rare. Mm -hmm. And so that means that if I'm making sauerkraut and I get a cabbage from a farm 10 miles from another place, maybe they have completely different bacteria. Maybe they'll ferment in different ways. So you could either use it um, to have an excuse if your sauerkraut doesn't work. Maybe you've got the wrong cabbage or we could use this research to improve, maybe you need to homogenize your cabbage that from different places. Could it possibly be, I was just thinking this now, um, in, I guess, macrobiology farming with plants and things like that, if a farmer has a particularly uh, good apple variant with, you know, sweet and all that kind of stuff, you could then spread that and grow lots more mm. of it. Could that it be similar with that? You find a particularly good combination of microorganisms and then yeah. you go, okay, this is now our gold standard for, yeah. for kimchi. We're going to use this for everything. Yeah. Um, I think people would love to find a starter. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking earlier about adding salt to ferments and definitely in like the pickle industry where you, may, you use a lot of brine to ferment pickles, finding 
low salt alternatives um, mm. is really important. So if you had a starter that was like a pre-formed community that was very stable, and then you didn't need to add as much salt in order to select against some of those earlier uh, microbes that are present, mm. maybe you would, could use low, you could make a low salt, even healthier sauerkraut. This is one thing, like sauerkraut is healthy, it has a lot of vitamin K in it, um, but it is a very salty product. You wouldn't yeah. eat too much. <laughs> yeah. All uh, right. Thank well, you for having me. Yeah, thanks for yeah. coming. Yeah. Uh, if you want to know any further things that Esther's talked about, uh, leave a yeah. questions or in the comments. Uh, yeah, but thanks for coming yeah. in. Thank you very much. Thanks. thanks.